everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, Challenges with School Attendance, Introduction for Parents and Caregivers. Thank you so much for joining us. This event is a collaboration between BC Children's Hospital, the Vancouver School Board, Vancouver Child and Youth Mental Health, and the Kelty Mental Health Resource Centre. Uh, my name is Michelle Horan, and I'm the Program Manager for BC Children's Kelty Centre. Uh, just a reminder also that your microphones have been muted and your cameras are automatically turned off. All right, so before we begin, I just wanted to provide a very brief introduction to the Kelty Mental Health Resource Centre. We're a provincial mental health and substance use resource centre, and we help families across the province by helping them understand and navigate the mental health and substance use system, listening and offering peer support from trained parent peer support workers through a collaboration with Family Smart, uh, and connecting families to mental health resources and tools. We will be putting our uh, contact information up at the end of the presentation, uh, so we'll, you'll be able to um, write that down then. And before we begin, uh, just a few important notes. So the information in this webinar applies to the context in British Columbia. Some information is specific to the Vancouver School Board. If you're in another jurisdiction, please consult local and health and school authorities for further information. And also if you your, or your child or someone you care about is having a mental health or substance use crisis, uh, please call 911 or go to your local hospital's emergency room. A few housekeeping notes. So all attendees are automatically muted, your cameras are turned off. If you have any technical questions, such as about accessing a recording or having issues with your sound or audio, um, please make any um, of those questions or comments through the chat function. There should be an icon at the bottom or the side of your screen. The webinar will be recorded. Um, at the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up that we invite you to complete. You'll also receive a link to this survey in an email that you'll receive tomorrow. We will be having a question and an answer session at the end of the presentation. So please submit any questions for the speakers um, through the Q&A function. Uh, so you'll see a Q&A icon. And there has been an option enabled where you can vote for questions that you want answered. And if you wish to remain anonymous, uh, there's a little button at the bottom of your Q&A box that says submit anonymously. So simply check off that button and you'll be able to submit your question anonymously. Uh, so just an overview of the webinar series and a reminder that this is this webinar here is part one of a two part series. So part two is split by age. Uh, so part two A is practical strategies to support school attendance in younger elementary school age children. And then part two B is practical strategies for high school aged youth. Uh, part 2A is on November 19th and Part 2B is on November 23rd. To register for Part 2A or 2B, just simply go to that uh, web address that you see on your screen. And we'll also include that link as well in the follow-up email tomorrow. Um, so all the speakers and the panelists today would like to acknowledge with immense gratitude that they all live, work, and play on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And finally, to present our speakers today. So we have uh, two main speakers today, uh, Dr. Alex DiGiacomo, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Clinic at BC Children's Hospital and the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia, as well as a psychology associate at Cornerstone Child and Family Psychology Clinic. She provides clinical services to children, youth, and families and conducts research to better understand anxiety disorders. Dr. Alex has a particular interest in supporting skillful and confident parenting and in equipping children to conquer fears and challenges. Alexandra Wilson is a VSB SASE Parent Engagement Coordinator offering parents of teens the opportunity to access parent coaching, psychoeducational workshops, and connections to community services. Her professional background is in group facilitation, education, human development, and learning, strengthened by 20 years of on-the-ground parenting foster parenting, and the learning received from all of the amazing families who make positive changes in their lives and the lives of their children. We also have some panelists who will be joining us today, um, closer to the Q&A session near the end. So Dr. Sarah Anderson, who is a psychologist and postdoctoral fellow at BC Children's Hospital and U UBC. Julie Collette, who's a registered clinical counselor with the Vancouver Coastal Health, Child and Youth Mental Health. She's a hospital and school liaison clinician and Dr. Rosalind Catchpole, who is a psychologist and the clinic head of the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Clinic at BC Children's Hospital. So thank you so much to our speakers and panelists today.
Hello. So we're going to just open a little bit uh, to acknowledge that we're covering a lot in about 40 minutes to be able to have some time for questions and answers. Um, so we're going to today really set the stage at looking at how we as families and parents can create kind of a foundation to be able to support our young people who might be having anxiety that is interfering with their attendance at school. So we're going to look at anxiety and how that can get in the way sometimes of getting to school. We're going to talk a bit about what it's like to be a parent on the front line. While there are lots of supports available for our kids at school and also professionally and in the community, it's kind of we're the ones who are there in the morning when it's time to support our kids to make it there. Uh, and this can be really hard, but there's stuff that we can do that can help strengthen us and help us have the stamina that's necessary to keep going forward. We're going to look at ways we can support our children and our youth and what they need from us as families. And then we'll do a little preview of part two. So a little bit more focused on whether we have elementary school age children or secondary school age children. You can go to the next slide if you like. That's great. So one of the things to just acknowledge is that anxiety and interfering with school attendance, that particular mix isn't anything new. But uh, we certainly have been supporting young people before the pandemic time, but also during this pandemic time, families are under different pressures and kids who may have been coping or maybe even kind of barely coping before may be finding it harder and harder to participate. So what's covered in the talk today applies whether or not school attendance was a struggle pre-pandemic um, or if it maybe continues to be a struggle now. And uh, I think one of the things just for us to remember is that school connectedness is just a huge part of feeling good and feeling safe at school um, and, and, a, and a positive relationship with adults and friends in the building is huge in young people's lives. Um, and that school looks different right now. So schools are working hard on maintaining that connection and we will really wanna be able to support that as much as we can. And finally, I just wanna say like the good news is that uh, we know what works and the same approaches by parents and by schools to support young people that worked around anxiety before the pandemic still work in this context. I have a, a colleague who says right now we're going through like a crash course in resilience. And I think that that's true as families and professionals and kids. We're going to be so amazing when we get through this. Thanks, Alexandra. And yeah, so when we talk about these challenges with school attendance, there really is a spectrum. So you might be listening in today and have a young person who is getting to school most days, but just having a lot of distress doing so. Or on the other hand, you might be dealing with a situation where your child or teen actually hasn't been to school in months. So we took care to create this talk in such a way that there really would be some take home messages for everybody. So whether you identify with either of those two scenarios or whether you're somewhere in the middle, there will be something for you here. And when it comes to the actual practical intervention strategies that you'll hear more about in part two, those will be tailored to your unique situation and where you are on this spectrum. So let's talk a little bit about what's behind the struggle with getting to school or staying at school. So today we're really referring to these kids and teens whose challenges in this area are anxiety based. And what we know from the research is that two to 5% of youth have difficulty getting to school due to anxiety. Now those statistics, the two to 5%, those are pre COVID. So we really do expect that those rates have gone up since the pandemic. And why would that be? Well, it's because these school attendance challenges tend to be more common. They tend to creep up during times of transition. So moving from kindergarten to grade one, middle school to high school, after summer break, or like right now, going back to in-person school after the lockdown. So right now, because this is a, you know globally a big transition for all of us, you might be in a situation where you have a young person whose challenges have actually gotten worse, or you might have actually never experienced these struggles before, and now all of a sudden with COVID, your child is having a hard time. I think it's actually also worth making clear what we're not talking about here. So although there can be some overlap, we're not talking primarily today about kids who are skipping school for fun or kids who are acting out. 
If you have a child or teen who's struggling with attending school, you've probably wondered um, probably several times what's in store for your child, both in the short term and in the long term. So what we know from the research is that these kinds of struggles aren't ones that we should ignore. And that's because without a proper plan in place, it's not uncommon for kids to end up missing more and more school over time. And when that happens, it can start to affect other parts of their lives, like friendships, self-esteem, and really it means that they might miss out on all kinds of important developmental opportunities. So that's the tough part to hear as a parent, but there is a lot of good news. So the good news is that there is so much that we can do and that can be done to help kids and teens recover from and even conquer these challenges. With the right coordination, planning, our young people absolutely can flourish. We've seen it time and time again. And you're in the right place because this webinar is designed to set you up so that you know what to do. So I hope you're hearing the balance that I'm trying to strike here, which is that yes, these aren't things that we can these are things that we can brush off, but we are well within our right to expect improvement and significant progress for our kids. So we've talked about how these school attendance challenges are anxiety based. Let's look at what might tell us some hints that might tell us that our kids are actually experiencing anxiety. Often people think anxious kids might just look worried or scared, but there are some other, maybe more subtle signs that are, yeah, less obvious. These can be things like physical complaints, lots of headaches and stomach aches. If you have a teen, one of the early signs might be lots of texts home to caregivers. Um, maybe some negotiating about, oh, can I maybe just not go to school today? Or can I go a little bit later? You might be noticing some more arguments in the morning, um, some irritability and just some problems with attention and forgetfulness and kids that are kind of more resistant um, to change. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And I think also, you know, while we're thinking about what things can look like, like sometimes it can be um, unexpected and maybe even shocking. I know in my uh, experience, when my child was eight years old, I remember her throwing herself on me and asking, am I going to die? And I could hear her heart, I could feel her heart pounding against me. And that flood of adrenaline in her body as she was shaking, um, you know, was really clear that something was going on, but not always clear what was going on. Um, I have a friend whose child actually reacted with a lot of anger and aggression. And again, that can be, that can be hard to pull apart and see that it's anxiety based. Age sometimes makes a difference. By the time my daughter was 14, um, instead of so many physical symptoms, exactly like what we think of as physical, she was having a symptom a brain fog, inability to concentrate, sitting in the classroom. She, she felt humiliated. She felt embarrassed, like she just couldn't be there. Um, when I would ask her about anxiety, she would say to me, you know, I don't feel anxious. I'm not leaving because I'm anxious. I'm leaving because I'm bored. You know, because as you get into adolescence and our kids are looking for that autonomy and, and sort of like um, having control over their own story, this can be harder and harder to pull apart. And that difference between skipping school for fun versus skipping school because it's really hard to be there, it can be more difficult to, for us to figure out. Yeah, thanks, Alexandra. Okay, so we hear this word anxiety a lot. Let's make sure that we actually know what it means. So first of all, anxiety is very, very normal. Everybody experiences it. There is, of course, a continuum. So some people experience very little of it, while other people experience a debilitating amount of anxiety. But everyone has at least a little bit. And that's good. That's necessary because anxiety is actually really important. So if I didn't have a little bit of anxiety about all of the technical aspects of this webinar going smoothly, I wouldn't have woken up super early to test it all out. And, you know, we may not have a functional presentation. Um, the other thing to note about anxiety is that it's, it's not harmful to us. Sometimes it feels like it's harmful, but it's not actually harmful. What it is, is it's uncomfortable and sometimes incredibly so. Let's look at why that is. So anxiety, it's, it's got four kind of parts to us. 
four random parts to it. So the first, it can give us these worried, sometimes panicky thoughts. It can give us these distressing physical symptoms like a fast heart rate. Um, it can make us have these distressing emotions like panic or dread or fear. And it can give us this urge to just avoid. So really all in all, it's, it's kind of like a signal to us that something bad is gonna happen. So avoid that thing. In some ways we can think about anxiety as being our alarm system. And it, it's, it's a system that keeps us alert to danger. You know, our sympathetic nervous system gets all activated to help us respond in a way that will keep us safe. Uh, we call it our fight, flight, freeze response. Our heart beats faster, blood flows to the muscles. We breathe, um, or we breathe faster. But sometimes what happens is that our alarm system actually gets triggered too easily. So I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was um, this text sent out to folks in Hawaii saying that there was a missile um, coming. And then 20 minutes later, they got another text saying, oh, sorry, it was a false alarm. So for our kids who have anxiety that is getting in the way of easily attending school, their alarm systems need retraining. Their anxiety systems are, are too sensitive. They're going off um, when they don't need to go off. It's kind of like the smoke alarm that goes off even though you may have ever so slightly burnt some food, you know, and the, the way that you respond to that kind of smoke alarm is very different than how you would respond to a smoke alarm if there's a real fire. Right. So I know a lot about this because I burn a lot of food. But when my fire alarm goes off and there's there's not a fire, you wouldn't you know, take your kids and run out the building. You would respond differently based on whether there's a threat or not. The other key thing about anxiety that is important to know is that it improves when we keep facing hard things. And that's not intuitive because, like I said before, anxiety makes us want to avoid let me walk you through why this is. So if you, if you were to ask your child to do something that they're worried about, initially their anxiety will go up, which is of course really hard to see as a parent. However, when it's at its peak, our bodies actually can't sustain that level of anxiety for very long. And the anxiety will quickly come down on its own as your child is in that situation. But let's say, for example, your child is worried and is nagging you and kind of negotiating about going to school um, on the morning. So their anxiety is increasing in that moment. And then you say, OK, fine, you don't have to go to school today, but you have to go tomorrow. What they're experiencing is this immediate sense of relief and decrease in their anxiety without the opportunity for that anxiety to have come down on its own and without the opportunity for them to have face the thing that they're afraid of. So the last memory that they have is one of escape. Now, the second or third or fourth or fifth time that, we, that the child faces something hard, their anxiety will actually be a little bit less than the time before and will similarly go down on its own. So after many repeated practices, or like we like to call them exposures, the anxiety will continue to decrease on its own until it's manageable and may not be a concern anymore. Our goal again is not to bring the anxiety down completely. We're not trying to eliminate anxiety entirely because that's just not realistic. Um, our, our goal is to cope with it and to be able to face our fears and not let it get in the way. So, you know, it, it's, it's worth saying that even kind of well-intended parents who maybe will let their kids stay home because it's just really distressing to see, um, it's you're kind of taking away the opportunity for the child to learn that by facing their fear, it actually goes down on its own. Okay, so that was anxiety. Now let's talk about anxiety in the context of parenting and caregiving. So I think I'm going to just explain this photo because it may not be entirely apparent what's happening. So this is an elephant. It's holding a buffalo. So the elephant is trying to protect its it's young. So I want you to think right now for a moment, um, as a parent, what is, what is your immediate response or what's the pull as a parent if you think about your child potentially in a dangerous situation? So for those of you with young kids, maybe picture them kind of climbing a really high play structure in the playground. Or for those of you with teens, imagine them getting in the, into the car and driving on their own for the very first time. 
Think about what, what the pull is. So probably what, what most of you are sort of thinking is that there's a pull to come in and protect. There's, there's some distress, there's some internal distress going on. And what we actually know is that feeling that you get, it doesn't actually differentiate between a real threat and a false threat. So Alexandra very kindly this morning pointed out to me that elephants are actually herbivores. So this elephant didn't actually maybe need to be eating this buffalo because the buffalo probably wouldn't have been going for the baby elephants anyway. So I didn't know that. I don't know very much about elephants, but that's just kind of a, a nice illustration to show that we are primed to feel this, dis this distress when our kids and our young um, are, in are possibly in danger because this is our biological wiring. So we are wired um, not only to protect our kids, but to be on a very high alert for their distress. Yeah, I always think that this idea of, you know, we are on high alert to our kids' distress, like how does that feel to us? It doesn't just feel like high alert, it actually feels like distress. We are in distress also. We're sad, we're scared. It, we, we, we may be imagining what's gonna happen if our kid can't get to school for the 13th day or the third month and we're starting to like project into the future. I remember, you know, my own child when she was in grade three and we had days and weeks of not wanting to go to school and all the work that was every morning of getting her to school and you know as a parent I just I just want to fix it and I remember one morning having this little one sitting on my lap and um, just really she was tearful and not wanting to go to school and I was staring up at the ceiling tears running down my face you know trying to have her not see that I was so distressed and in that moment I just really realized that I was not going to be able to be a good advocate for her and support her in being able to face this or to put a plan in place with supports at the school because I was reacting to that false alarm and I think, you know, if we can take a step back from our kids' distress, it doesn't mean we don't care, but it means we might have a little bit more um, control, I guess, over our own emotions so that we're really able to help things move forward. Yeah. And so in, this, in the exact same way that we are on high alert to our children's distress, they are, they are also on high alert for ours. So they look to us in the same way that we can notice things in them, which means that although it's really easy for us to catch our own kids' fear, it's also easy for them to catch our fear. And then that cycle just goes around and around and around. And like Alexander was alluding to, it gets exhausting. And the reason it's exhausting is because you love your child. You want them to be okay. You care about them. What tends to happen when this cycle goes around and around and around is we may actually struggle to cope with their distress because it's so high in them and it's so high in us. And as a result of that, we may feel like we're actually not able anymore to set limits and set expectations. Yeah, and I think, you know, sometimes we're looking for the thing, what can we do? And I love that previous slide because one of the things that we can do is work on our own fear and work on how it is that we can be calm. And it seems a little bit counterintuitive because really what we want to do is just fix it so it's easy for them to go to school. But really that first step is what is it that we can do? Um, and I kind of want to acknowledge two things. One is that we probably have a wide range of situations, people who are listening, as Alex um, indicated at the beginning, and there can be really complicating factors towards what's going on for our kids at school socially, or maybe in terms of learning disabilities, or there can be a ton going on. And wherever you are in that range, um, what we can do is learn how to stay calm and consistent, and hopeful and educate ourselves in how to put a plan in place. So I wanna say like, this is such a stereotype, right? The putting your oxygen mask on first. And you know, every time I see it, there's part of me that's like, yeah, 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 I know. But it wasn't until um, somebody actually broke it down for me in literal terms that I understood how powerful this is. And that was, you know, if you put your oxygen mask 
on your six-year-old and then you pass out, your six-year-old does not have the strength to lift you up to the ceiling where the oxygen mask is dangling. And when it was explained to me in that way, it's kind of horrific, but also really, really clear. So looking after ourselves is not about being selfish. It's not about putting ourselves first. Um, because, you know, it's completely possible to try to help someone move through their anxiety in a way that actually provokes more anxiety, right? So the tension on our face, the frightened or angry or fed up tone, it's not telling our kid everything is okay, we're gonna move through this. It's telling them things are kind of not okay. And, but how do we get there? How do we get there so that we have that calmness? I certainly remember the many, many mornings of going to wake up my 15-year-old, walking down the hall towards her bedroom, thinking, okay, what's this going to be like? What's this going to be like? Honestly, nine times out of 10, it was, I'm not going to school. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to hear. So the thing is, any of the strategies that we're talking about, either in this section or in part two, are going to be more effective if we have the stamina to stay calm and to carry them through and to be consistent. How do we prepare ourselves not to be too reactive? We need our oxygen mask. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that a professional said to me about working with my child throughout her, all the way through her teenage years, was that, you know, our kids who work to overcome their anxiety are gonna be amazing adults. Because when they're 25 or when they're 35 and regular life stresses come in, okay, I don't wanna say it's gonna be nothing compared to what they went through as teenagers, but they already have the skills and they know how to do that. Um, and I can certainly see that in my adult children now. Um, maybe we can turn the slide. So I think what we're asking for ourselves here First, as parents and caregivers is, can we just look inwards a little bit? And can we really recognize the cost of supporting a young person through a process, right? Because this isn't overnight. There's not like some little magic wand. You probably heard Dr. Alex saying, you know, the fifth or sixth or seventh time they face their anxiety, it goes down a little bit, right? So this is a process. And what do we need to stay the course? We need good sleep, we need good food, we need fun. Yes, fun, you see it right there. As adults, we need to be doing those things that make us feel a little bit good in our lives. Um, and I have the little eye rolling emoji because I think we all sort of do this oh, self-care. You know, yoga is not gonna get my kid to school. And you know, yoga is great if it really gives you that feeling of being grounded and calm, then absolutely. Um, but there's all kinds of things that we can be doing in our lives. And I kind of, I sort of want to ask a question, you know, if you've got a day or a regular day in your life where getting to the bathroom or having a shower feels like self-care, I just want to respectfully say maybe we're setting the bar too low, okay? I want, to, I want us to be doing things in our lives that make us happy, that maybe make us honestly forget that we're a parent for 15 minutes. And that might be yoga for you, you know, or it might be reading or walking or basketball or journaling or crafts or playing with the dog or whatever it is for you. Those small things regularly done actually do work, but they only work if we do them. We can go to the next slide, thank you. So after, again, thinking about the wide range of families that may be listening to this presentation, um, it may be that after weeks and months uh, that you are really struggling, maybe you find that you can't sleep or you can't concentrate, you're struggling to make decisions or you're feeling helpless or hopeless, maybe you're not able to control your feelings. Um, all of the suggestions on the slide can absolutely help us to manage our emotions, but I want to say if we've reached that kind of point of constant stress, that as the adult, we could check in with our own doctor, that we could maybe visit a drop-in clinic and be looking at some supports from, for ourselves. So focusing on what we can do rather than what we can't, expressing our feelings, 
um, I don't know if I need to say this, but not expressing our feelings to our kids about this, but talking to a partner or a friend or phoning up a, a, a relative or even going to see a counselor, for you to be able to talk about those feelings can be really helpful. We don't have enough time to talk a lot about um, supports that parents can put in place for themselves in this way, but you'll see the link down at the bottom. Uh, here to help and certainly uh, Kelty Mental Health has a lot more for parents there. So I just want to take a minute here with us and take three deep breaths. I don't know if people who are watching this webinar know that it's very difficult to learn when you're all elevated and it's true for us as adults as it is for our kids. So just to show that actually small things work, I'm going to ask you to participate. Everybody's camera's off, so it's really just me here up front. I'm gonna ask you to sit up in a comfortable position, but straight. Maybe put your hand on your belly, just below your ribs, and you can put your other hand up on your chest. We're going to take a deep breath in through our nose and really kind of let it fill up our belly and then push it out through our lips. We'll do that three times. So you can have your eyes open or closed, it's up to you. Thank you. So I said earlier in that little cycle of our fear and our child's fear and what can we do? As adults, we can actually consciously override that parasympathetic nervous system that gets us all elevated. We can practice taking deep breaths and calm down. When we're able to calm our bodies, then we're also able to calm our minds. And I'm actually not suggesting that you take this breathing exercise and teach your kids, okay? This is for us to keep ourselves calm so that we can do the support work that we need to do. Okay, so, oh no, thank you. This is our poll time. If we could put up our poll. So on the poll, uh, the question is, do you do something to take care of yourself? Whatever that means to you, how do you stay grounded and calm? Is there something you like to do no matter what others think? So if you just take a moment, answer the poll and uh, I believe, and you must hit submit for it to come to us. So there are a few options there. And while we're waiting, we're just gonna continue to do some slow breathing and keep ourselves grounded. You know, another thing we can do is that we can actually be kind of consciously compassionate for ourselves in this difficult process. Um, it's stressful parenting a child who has anxiety to the extent that it's preventing them from going to school. And we're going to make mistakes. We're not perfect. But the tips and ideas that come through in the next few minutes are things that we can try that can improve the situation. So I don't know if we have time for the results now, but um, that's great. Yay, look at that, 36% several times a week. I don't know if it's silly for me to say I'm so proud of you, but I'm so proud of you that we've got this group of over 300 parents who are paying attention to self-care. That's super great. And you know, if you're trying to, that's excellent. And for those few who said no, Mm. I know you can do it. And I'm going to give you just a little tiny challenge. I'm thinking that we've got two or three more days before the presentation on secondary school, and we've got a week until the presentation on elementary school. So I'm going to see, I'm going to just put this out there that if you're one of the people who said no, maybe you could just try to do one thing between now and the next presentation that is enjoyable and is just for you. We can move the slide on. 
Thank you for that, Alexandra. So now that we're all feeling maybe a little bit more calm, uh, let's talk about what to do or how to respond in that moment. So let's picture a, a moment maybe that happens frequently for you and your family. Maybe it's the moment where you know your, your child is yelling and, and arguing in the morning, not wanting to go to school. A moment where emotions are high. That's what we're talking about now. So we're going to break this down into three steps. Step one is step back. Step two is balance the scale. Step three is empathize and encourage. And I want to just point out that the first two steps have nothing to do with your child. They're all things that happen internally for you as a parent. Oopsies. Okay, so let's start with, with number one, step one, step back. So we have the benefit as adults to kind of be aware of our sympathetic nervous system and aware of our response. So we, we can actually take control of that and sort of notice what is our automatic reaction in these moments. For many of you, you'll feel overwhelmed, we'll feel angry, annoyed, paralyzed, numb. There'll be these thoughts going through your head like, enough, like we've got to get her to school now. Will this ever end? Am I hurting her? There's just this flood of emotions happening. And what we can do at this moment is like Alexander was saying, take a breath and remind ourselves our kids' fear is fueling ours right now. So their false alarm is getting us going. That's what's happening. That's what all of this flood of emotions is. It's a, it's a false alarm. Okay, so we noticed that. And then step two is balance the scale. So for a variety of reasons, which we won't, we won't get into now, each of us has kind of a, a way that we tend to respond, whether it's um, being too tough in the moment or giving in too much in the moment. And um, this can differ depending on, on the, the child. So you may have a different kind of tendency depending on what child it is. It may differ based on the kind of emotion that the child is, is displaying. And it can also change day by day. I used to have a supervisor who said that with her kids, she would be too nice, too nice, too nice, too nice, and then mean. And then she'd just switch to mean right away. And so um, this, does, this does, isn't saying that you're always one or the other, but it's helpful to notice which way you tend to go so that you can um, sort of know which way to correct. And let me just explain a little bit about these two ends. So the being too tough would be if, you know, if your instinct, the first thing that comes to mind is this is not a big deal. Just go to school. I thought you were excited. Come on, let's do this. That sort of thing. Or, or having um, expectations that are too high or pushing too hard. The other end is really, really feeling for the kid and um, allowing for kind of excessive allowances. So, oh, you poor kid, I'm so sorry. This is too hard. Okay, you can stay home. So kind of notice um, for the child that you're watching this talk on behalf of, which way you, you tend to go. Step three is empathize and encourage. So what we know from the research is that both of these are really important. So the empathy piece is important because what the research shows is that if you can be with your child and empathize with them, it actually brings distress down to a level where you can make a change and, and they can face their fears easier. But that's not all we need. Empathy on its own is not enough. We also need to encourage kids to actually face their fears. And we need to do this at the same time. So we can say something like, I know this feels really hard and I believe that you can do it. Really that step three, empathize and encourage, it's just another way of saying communicate confidence. Now I just wanna make a, what I think is a very important point right now. You will not do this perfectly probably not even close. And that is 100% okay. Kids do not need us to do this perfectly. Um, not at all. So, so that's okay. And the good news here is that just like our kids fear drives ours and then there's a cycle, exact same thing happens with the bravery. So even if we're not feeling it on the inside, if we can communicate confidence to our child, they will pick up on that. And then it'll start a whole new um, feedback loop. I just wanted to provide an example also here for how we might word this because sometimes it's helpful to have a bit of a template. So um, you can say something like, thanks for telling me you're feeling scared about going to school today. When I feel scared, I want to avoid stuff too. 
let's talk about some of the things we can do to help you get there today. I do wanna also point out that for kids who've been out of school for a while, this is gonna happen in a very gradual step-by-step -step way. And we'll hear more about that in part two. So, so those exact words may not apply if your child has been out of school for a while, um, but you'll, you'll hear about how to tweak that so that it, this, this same framework fits for, for your child and where, where they're at. I love that, Alex. Thank you about the um, maybe having a template, having some phrases ready to use, right? This goes back to us as parents taking a little while to reflect on what we need and how it is that we're going to be doing this. And there really is such a range of situations. So this is a framework that will support you wherever your child is on the continuum, but not so much a framework that we're expecting you to start tomorrow morning, right? It's part of a process. So if you think about it this way, here we are, it's an ordinary Thursday morning, somewhere in your return to school plan, you've been taking care of yourself, you've been getting good sleep, you've been eating well, you've been doing those personal activities on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday that help you to be calm on Thursday. We're reminding ourselves, right, that our goal is to separate ourselves from our kids' anxiety and remind ourselves that we know they can do it. And we know that anxiety and fears when faced begin to reduce. We know that it's gonna take time. It's gonna feel uncomfortable, but it's not harmful for our kids. And we're gonna try not to respond to their false alarm, right? Okay, it's a lot of work that's happened before we do anything at all. We're gonna try and stay in the middle um, and not go to like the over reassurance and saying that they can stay home or the over there's nothing wrong, overly dismissive and sending them there. So maybe, you know, we're gonna validate. We're gonna say things like, yeah, I hear you. It feels hard sometimes. And I love that it feels hard, not it is hard. This is a really um, important shift to make in our language, right? Because that is how it feels to our kids, but we don't actually wanna be reinforcing that what they're trying to do is something that's really difficult. Um, it'll be easier when you get there. We can remind them of things that we've talked about in the past that give them confidence. Now, you know, sometimes uh, it feels like cheerleading and sometimes that is more effective with younger kids than older kids. You can talk with your teenagers about what might be helpful, not in the morning when they're feeling anxiety, but like maybe on the weekend on a walk. And if there's something that they think will be helpful, then we can try and do that, right? Imagining you're a superhero, you're walking into school with your cape flowing. Distraction can be a great one. You know, come on downstairs while I make breakfast and tell me about that movie you were laughing about last night. Or what's that What's that uh, online game that you've been playing? Who, who are you hanging out with online? I heard you giggling last night and I just like, you know, tell me who your online friends are. Getting laughter, getting distraction and moving towards small steps. So, you know, how about you get dressed while I'm making a smoothie? Just, that's all. We're just asking to get dressed. Um, with a teenager, it may be that, you know, here, I'll turn on your music. I'll let you know when breakfast is ready. How about you just put your shoes on? We don't need to talk about it right now. Or we'll talk about it in the car. Or let's go for a walk around the block. And you can tell me about those boots you want me to buy you. When we're looking at encouragement and empathy, the age of the child can make a difference, but please don't assume your teenager doesn't wanna hear those things. Um, they need that, they need to hear that. And I guess in a final note, I would sort of say, let's think about you know controlling our own inner voices. So I know it's been said a few times, but like it's okay if inside you feel like, oh my God, are you gonna be okay? If outside, we can say you can do this, right? Or if inside we wanna say, keep your phone on, you can call or text me if you need me. Well, they know that. And if we say it, then we're just kind of re-emphasizing that we think maybe they can't get through it. So we can say something like, just see you soon, sweetheart. So you'll see a whole bunch of lists there on the, on the slide that I'm not gonna read through, but they have some other ideas. And I just want to remind us that we're not alone. I, I do know that sometimes it feels like we're alone as a parent with a child who has a hard time going to school. And sometimes it can be really difficult to be getting those phone calls from really you know, caring teachers and school staff and administrators who are like trying to encourage us how to get our kid to school, but we're not alone. 
and we need to build our team. So I'm kind of going to say like over the next week, before you watch the next section, can you think about who can be on your team to support you? So it can be people in the education system for sure, but it can also be your own family doctor. It can also be a mental health care worker. They can be friends and neighbors and other parents. I've tried to say several stories over the course of this presentation with my daughter's permission to share those stories. Um, other parents are there and we can support each other in this. So finally, along with building your team, I'm also going to extend that challenge that I gave to our 10 parents who said they don't very often do things to support themselves and feel like something fun for them. I'm gonna extend that challenge to everybody. Maybe over the next few days, we can make lists. Let's say between five and 10 things that you're curious about, that you like to do, that you used to like to do, um, and see if we can start incorporating some of those things into our lives. Okay, so we'd love to get to some Q&A just because I know this is a lot of content and I'm, I'm sure there are some questions. So I'm gonna quickly wrap us up here. What we learned, some take home messages. Anxiety is very distressing and it's not harmful. And we know that it gets better when we face our fears. Another key point, our kids' fear feeds our fear, feeds their fear, and it goes round and round exact same thing for bravery. It's important to communicate confidence. And in order to do that, we need to take care of ourselves as best we can. Next time, we're going to get um, practical strategies and practical interventions for how we can implement, um, implement help for, for our kids and teens. Okay, these are a list of resources. You're going to get, um, if you register for this webinar, you'll get a copy of these in an email tomorrow. Um, I do just want to highlight Child and Youth Mental Health. Um, that's an excellent resource. We'll hear a little bit, hopefully, from Julie Collette, who can speak to that a bit more. Um, but Child and, Child and Youth Mental Health is a really good resource. You can self-refer there. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Giacomo and Alexandra Wilson. What a wonderful presentation. There was so much helpful information in there for families. Uh, so now we have an opportunity uh, to get to some questions asked by our attendees. Uh, so the first one is, um, what about the distress that can lead to brain fog and a lack of focus that can compound the distress of school and uh, potentially a student's competence? Yeah, Dr. Catchpole. Yeah, I have a few thoughts to share about that. And then, of course, others, please jump in. So I think, you know, the first thing to remember is that that feeling of brain fog that kids and teens have usually feels worse to them than it is noticeable to those around them. And so sometimes giving kids some ways to cope with that feeling of like, what am I going to do if I get called on and I'm not sure of the answer and actually role play some of those situations can go a long way to helping really what is that anxious thought of what if I get called on and then I'm not sure what's going on. Another thing is when we remember that it comes from that sympathetic nervous system activation. I always joke with families. I'm like, try running from a bear and then ask, like, I'll ask you what's 13 times 14, right? Like we just can't do those kinds of things. And so another thing is just to think about that biological piece of the sympathetic nervous system and even really simple things like getting a little exercise before school actually helps to calm that biological component of the anxiety. And so for older kids and teens who are really aware, this is one of the reasons it's hard for me to go to school, they might be quite on board with that idea that we can burn off some of that extra energy um, and, and we can feel better. So those are, those are some of my thoughts. It's a great question. Great, does anyone else have anything to add or would you like me to move on to the next question? Good to move on. Okay, so the next question is from a parent of a 14 year old who has been out of school for three weeks, uh, who is recovering from a mental health crisis, including uh, debilitating panic attacks at school. So this 14 year old is not only resistant to going back to school, but also other activities like going outside or visiting friends. Um, and this parent just wondering what they can do because it, it feels impossible, the idea of getting them back to school.
I'm happy to speak to that as well. Then please, please, I don't want to hog the Q&A, so please others jump in. Um, what you guys are going to hear about more in the next webinar is really how to break some of this stuff down. And so what I would say is, you know, when a child or teen has been, you know, in more of crisis or really experiencing awful panic attacks, the main thing that happens when we have panic attacks is we dread being in situations where we might have a panic attack again. And so it sounds like for this child that that's generalized a little bit, even to just going places with friends or being out of the house. And so all the wonderful stuff that Alexandra and Dr. Alex presented really applies in terms of when we can slowly take steps and be brave and face those fears, it really does get easier. But what that looks like for some kids and teens is that we start not at school. We start with something that is fun, motivating, not too hard. And you really, it's like training the muscles again or retraining that alarm system. And so, you know, trying to work on ways to get out of the house every day, you know, maybe have a phone call with a friend, go get some, I don't know, food at the drive-thru or whatever you guys are doing, you know, during the COVID times, um, really are, set the stage for that next step of attending school. And then again, as will be talked about in the next part of the webinar, then there's, you know, there's an art to also going step by step with that school return um, in a way that lets the youth feel successful and supported as they get through those usually typically just those early first, you know, few days and weeks where they're still feeling nervous about what happens if I do panic or I get too anxious. Um, so, so those are some of my thoughts and others, please weigh in. Yeah. Yeah, the, only thing, oh. the only thing I would add to that really is sometimes when your child's life looks so different from what it used to, it can seem daunting because you're thinking like, okay, how are they going to get from here all the way to there? And one thing I would say is to count on the momentum that happens. So those first few steps in those first few weeks are really hard, but often what happens is when kids build that momentum and start to see some successes, it starts to go faster. So it's not always linear like this. So, so if you're feeling like, okay, those first few steps have taken a month, that doesn't necessarily mean that the whole recovery will take, you know, that times whatever number of steps you have left. It can sometimes go faster. The only thing that I would add to what everybody has said is um, kind of directly to the parent, how hard it is to be patient and to, and to understand that um, it is going to take some time. And that yes, school is important, but mental health is really important. And if we sort of think that we're doing first things first and helping this young person to to be solid and um, to, to begin to take those steps, school will come, it, it, it'll come, it'll, it'll come. We can worry about the academics a little bit down the road, although I'm not suggesting she not go to school. I'm just saying that, that as the parent, that doesn't have to be our worry, right? That our 14 year old isn't going to graduate. We don't, we don't need to worry about that. Let's do first things first. Great. Okay, so our next question is, so how do you distinguish between kind of more general or amorphous anxiety and anxiety that stems uh, from issues that they need support with, like bullying, for example, um, especially if the child has been dealing with social issues? Um, I can answer this if you like. Um, well, it sounds like, first of all, uh, if you're unsure Speaking with your family doctor is always a good option to discuss what's really going on and then get uh, a few ideas about next steps. It may be uh, trying um, smaller things like exercise, like um, sleep hygiene, um, regular routines, or it may be more involved where um, a self-referral to child and youth mental health may be applicable and, and what that involves uh, looks different depending on where you are in the province, but basically um, it's self-referral and child and youth mental health sees kids on a spectrum of more moderate to severe. And so we will meet with your child and yourself and really find out what's going on from a strengths-based lens and figure out what the next steps might be 
whether there's community supports in place that would be a fit or whether child and youth mental health is a fit at that time. I'll add as well that um, next time in part two, we'll just be talking a little bit more about connecting with schools and, and really harnessing that as a, as a huge strength and, and getting information from schools and communicating what you've seen as, as caregivers with schools as well. And so I would say um, in that case, oftentimes schools will really have a lot to contribute in terms of uh, what they've seen um, and, and what supports they might have available depending on what it is that that's going on for your child there and that will help differentiate that a little bit. Okay, so we have time for a few more questions. Uh, so the next one is uh, from a parent who's wondering if they're where they should go if they themselves are having personal acute anxiety, um, not wanting to this over anxiety to, you know, damage their children in any way. Um, I can speak to this uh, briefly. So I would say the, the Here to Help um, link that Alexander uh, and, and Dr. Alex included um, here and in the resource section is a great place to start. Um, also, I want to refer to our wonderful uh, Kelty Mental Health Resource team as an excellent place um, to reach out and just ask them and there might be more um, specific uh, details that you might be able to provide that they might be able to use to help direct you to some resources that might be um, a better fit. Also, I'd just like to um, throw out there uh, if to don't forget that you may have an employee assistance program through your work where there's someone that you can talk to there. And also um, across the province, there are parent support groups offered by um, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, which is another public agency that might be a fit for you in terms of getting support, uh, which I think is really important. <laughs> Yeah, and family doctors can be another resource as well to kind of check in and get a bit of a sense of how, how significant that anxiety is and, and some other appropriate ref referrals or options as well. Great, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, how do we factor other mental health challenges such as depression into breaking this anxiety cycle? I'm happy to speak to that a bit and then like others, please jump in. So. It's a really great question. And of course, we're, you know, we're focusing more on anxiety in this talk, but with depression, what we see is often changes in kids' routines, sleep, eating patterns, social lives, and things like that. And so the good news is depression treatment and anxiety treatment aren't totally different from each other. But what we want to see when kids are really struggling with depression is really good attention to those basic self-care things, you know, sleep and food and things like that. And then what we often start with in depression treatment is what we call behavioral activation. And what that is, is slowly and gradually starting to increase the amount of things that kids are doing. And in particular, focusing on things that make kids feel good, you know, give them some pleasure and also make them feel good about themselves. And so looking, you know, within your own life at what that might look like for your child or teen, you know, if they're artistically talented, is there, you know, something they might do in that realm or are they particularly connected to, you know, one person uh, at school, you know, might they have a bit of time to connect with them. So I think really thinking about sort of slowly, again, some of the, in some of these situations, we're kind of building some of those muscles up Um you know, before they're ready for some of these other things. And, and with depression, it really is about kind of restructuring and repatterning some of those things. So that, that's what I would say. And please others jump in as well. The only other thing that I might add is, and I, I can't speak to your specific child here, but but oftentimes, or sometimes at least, what we see is that depression um, can be somewhat secondary to anxiety. So sometimes what we see is that when we implement these really great evidence-based treatments for anxiety and we um, help kids to approach rather than avoid situations that they're fearful of, that we also see that depression sort of lift um, naturally through the course of the anxiety anxiety treatment as well. And I think this is, you know, partially um, or very much so because of what Dr. Catchwell was mentioning, because kids are sort of 
of re-engaging with the world around them and sort of better able to, you know, interact with friends or participate in different activities that they might have been scared to do before, um, that by virtue of not doing those things, we're kind of contributing to them being a little bit more withdrawn or depressed. Okay, and just looking at the time, um, I think that brings us to the end of our webinar. I recognize there are so many questions that have come through that we haven't had a chance to answer. Um, so we'll put a slide up next that has our contact information for the Kelty Center. Um, so there's our email, keltycenter at cw.bc.ca and our toll-free phone number, 1-800-665-1822. Please don't hesitate to contact us um, if you had a question that we didn't have time to answer today. I'm gonna to be very happy to support you with information and resources. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for attending today. Thank you so much to our speakers and our panelists for all this wonderful information. And um, when the webinar closes, you'll be directed to a survey. And if you could please just spend two minutes filling up the survey, that would really help us in improving our webinars and making sure that we're doing future webinars that will be helpful for you. So thank you again, everyone. <laughs>